Welcome to PBC Online. My name is Andy Cook. As I record this, I have three audiences in mind. Audience one, PBC people who want to stay connected. They're not able to be at an in-person service because of work or travel or health or something else like that. And so they want to stay connected. Guys, I want you to know that you matter to us. And thank you so much for prioritizing your connection to the PBC body and not missing a sermon in the middle of a series and all of that. We're so glad that you want to stay connected. We do this for you. Audience number two, people who are checking PBC out. One person recently said to me, we stalked you online before we came. I just want you to know we're good with that. We wanted to give you a, a no-risk way to get a taste of what happens at a PBC weekend service. With online, it, I, I love it because you don't have to worry about what to wear, right? If, like you would if you came here. You, wouldn't, you don't have to worry about where to go in the building and navigating you know, that first time. You don't have to worry about you know, what if you hate it and you want to leave but the service isn't done. With online, it's really easy. You just click the little X at the top, right, and you're done. You don't have to worry about, you know, do they take an offering, do they want my money, any of those kinds of things. And we wanted to give you a, a way to check us out and get a taste for what a weekend service is like without any of those risks. So we're really glad that you found your way to PBC Online. I want you to know that we pray for that to happen, and we're excited that you're here. I, I should say this, know that what happens here at PBC Online is a taste of what happens at an in-person service. There's certain pieces that we can't duplicate here online, but there are some other things that we get to do online that are even better. So I'm just really excited that you're here. Audience number three, people who want to take that first step in connecting with us. They, they want to meet someone before they, they try attending an in-person service. Uh, if that's you, my encouragement to you is go to the live chat service. That's at 8.45 on Sundays, if at all possible. When you get there, say hello or request prayer. And, and I just wanted you to hear me say thank you so much for being brave. We applaud you for doing that. Well, you probably fit into one of these three audiences, right? PBC people who want to stay connected, people who are just checking us out, stalking us, right? Or people who want to take that first step of connecting. Uh, like I said, I, I'm guessing that you probably fit into one of those. If you don't, would you please let me know so that I can keep you in mind as I prepare each week to meet with you here at PBC Online. One more thing, we have several opportunities for those of you who live in our neck of the woods. Let me just run down through them. We've got a ladies and girls uh, craft days coming up. We have a harvest dinner coming up. We're gonna have a Christmas play and we got a Christmas church service. Please reach out if you wanna know more about any of those. We'll get you the information you need. We will not spam you. And of course, there's absolutely no obligation. We just want you to know what's out there and we'll get you that information. All right, let's pray. Father God, thank you so much for giving us the opportunity to, to connect, to gather, to share online. I pray that you will be pleased with what takes place here. I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, we're going to bring the praise band on. Feel free to sing along. If you're watching the live chat, feel free to hit that little heart button at any time during the songs or even during the sermon, right? And, and feel free to hit that clap button as the song ends. Let's join the praise band. Approach the throne of glory. Nothing in my hands I bring but the promise of acceptance from a good and gracious King.
so encouraged by what Pastor Andy said, that our shame and our guilt is covered by the blood of Jesus Christ. We look forward to that day that this life is as bad as it's going to get for those who are Christ's followers. And we do that through the goodness and the mercy of God and his strength. We're going to sing about our strong God now. We just sing this last song with us together. Sing Father to the Fatherless. Father to the Fatherless, Defender of the weak. Freedom for the prisoner, we sing. This is God in His holy place. This is God. Faithful to provide 
Uh, hello. Excuse me. Sorry. Uh, just getting a little bit of a nourish bit here. Uh, perhaps I should explain what I'm doing. I just felt the need to build my strength up with uh, some Lunchables here. You, do, you remember, do you remember Lunchables? You ever have those? I remember when I used to get these in my school lunch. That was always a treat when I got those. I, I don't know if you go online before, this, before you watch this and print off the outline. Uh, and if you've done it consistently, you'll notice that there's sort of a trend. Pastor Andy's outlines, when he does them, he tends to have a lot of blanks on his, sometimes front and back, smaller font. He, he puts a lot of information on there. Uh, I tend to be the opposite. Sometimes I only have three or four blanks, and I always have to spread them out to make it look like they take up the full piece of paper. Well, this week, I've got front and back and a smaller font and lots of blanks to fill out. And maybe you print it out, and you're looking at that, and you're saying, man, I know when Pastor Joel only has three or four or five blanks, it takes about 30 minutes. He's got maybe 20 blanks on there. How long are we going to be here? <laughs> I'm going to need to build up some strength. That's what I'm doing here. That's what I thought would be, that we're going to be here for a little while. I wish I could share, share some of this with you. Uh, and if you were here with me and, and we were getting ready to do this, you know, maybe I'd say, well, let's, let's pass this around. How far would this go? How much of this would you get? Well, of course, the question is going to be, well, how many of us are there? I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with Lunchables. There's, you know, usually five or six just little round cracker things in here. And there's some pieces of turkey and cheese in here. And then there's two Oreos. That might be the favorite part. I'm looking forward to eating those when this is done. Uh, if there's just a couple of us, you might get a few pieces of each thing. That'd give you just a little bit of a snack. If there were six of us. Uh, well, then you might get one of each little thing. That's not going to tide you over very far. I better start talking a little bit faster before you get too much more hungry. What if there's 20 of us in the room? Well, then you might just get one thing, like one cracker or one piece of turkey and so on. It wouldn't last very far, would it? It wouldn't, wouldn't last very long, wouldn't give you much nourishment. I was thinking about that as we continue this series, Jesus, Kids, and You. And maybe you know the story that we're going to look at. You can tell where this is going. I want to talk today as we continue this series about the feeding of the 5,000. Have you heard of that miracle? Maybe you've heard this story before. Maybe for you this is going to be the first time. Interestingly enough, this miracle of Jesus is the only one that's mentioned in all four Gospels. We're going to look specifically at John's account of this gospel, so let's read it together. All right, if you're ready, the words will be on your screen, or you can turn your Bibles to John chapter 6. Let's read together. After this, Jesus crossed the Sea of Galilee, or Tiberias. A huge crowd was following him because they saw the signs that he was performing by healing the sick. Jesus went up a mountain, and he sat down there with his disciples. Now the Passover, a Jewish festival, was near. So when Jesus looked up and he noticed a huge crowd coming toward him, he asked Philip, where will we buy bread so that these people can eat? He asked this to test him, for he himself knew what he was going to do. Philip answered him, 200 denarii worth of bread wouldn't be enough for each of them to have even a little. One of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, there's a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? Jesus said, have the people sit down. There was plenty of grass in that place, so they sat down. The men numbered about 5,000. Then Jesus took the loaves, and after giving thanks, he distributed them to those who were seated, so also with the fish, as much as they wanted. When they were full, he told his disciples, collect the leftovers so that nothing is wasted. So they collected them and filled 12 baskets with the pieces from the five barley loaves that were left over by those who had eaten. When the people saw the sign that he had done, they said, This truly is the prophet who is to come into the world. Therefore, when Jesus realized that they were about to come and take him by force to make him king, he withdrew again to the mountain by himself. Now, there is so much that's going on here. And there's a lot of imagery things here that we could be talking about, things that are kind of tying it back to the Old Testament. And then there's a lot of different, different directions excuse me, that we could take the next few minutes. But 
I don't know, as I, as I was reading that this week and just, just thinking about this story, I don't know about you, but this is one of those stories where I think it's really tough to grasp. What would that have been like to have been there? I mean, what, what really happened? I mean, I come away with so many questions. I, I don't know about you, but just questions begin to, to flood my mind as we read a story like this. Uh, and so let's go through some of those questions. I mean, like one of the first questions is, well, how did he do it? I mean, I mean like logistically, how, how did Jesus do this? Like, what did, what did it actually look like? I mean, we don't know much. Scripture doesn't tell us, like, really specifically how this happened. We can see a few things from the four different accounts. If we kind of bring them all together, we can maybe tell a couple of different things. Uh, I mean, we know that Jesus took the food, and it says he blessed it. You know, he thanked God for this food that they were about to eat. It says he broke bread, you know, maybe actually began to take the loaves and tear them in half or tear them into pieces or, or something like that. And then he gave them to the disciples for the disciples to pass out. And Mark uses this specific phrase, and Luke uses it too in his gospel account. It says that Jesus kept giving them to his disciples to set before the people. He kept giving it to them. So how did this work? Right? Like, did the pile that Jesus was, was, was breaking bread into, like, did it just continue to grow and grow? Or, or did the disciples come up with the empty basket they had just passed out and Jesus reached below the counter and pulled out another basket that was full? And, and just, like, how, how did he do it? You know, I wonder that. I don't know about you. Maybe you've, you've ever wondered that. But here's, here's the answer. Then how did Jesus do it? No idea. Uh, we don't know exactly how it actually worked. We know it worked. We know he did it. But we don't entirely know how. But here's the next question. Well, do we understand how many people were actually there? Uh, what size is this crowd? Now, Scripture tells us there were 5,000 men there. And at that time, they would have kept records by only counting men. They didn't count women and children. So commentators all agree that you could put the estimate here somewhere between Ten to twenty-five thousand people. You know, depending on you know, was there was there uh, was everybody have one wife or was there one wife and one kid or one wife and two kids? You know, was there families there? So you know, let's let's pull twenty thousand people as our estimate. Twenty thousand people. How many people is that? I, I began to Google and just search population records, uh, statistics for our area, our region here in western New York. And I pulled some numbers that I think must be like township numbers, not necessarily village numbers, if that makes sense. So these are pretty wide regions. So I said, okay, well, let's start with Panama. Well, according to the internet, so you know it's true, there are 461 people in Panama. Okay, that's a start. Well, what about Clymer and Asheville? Those would be two of the next closest townships. Climber's got about 1,600 people. Asheville's a little bit more than 3,200. Okay, we are, we are on our way now to 20,000 people. We got Panama, Climber, Asheville. Let's throw in Sherman. We got some folks that come from the Sherman area. Let's throw in Corey. We got some folks that come over from that way. You add those two in there. That's getting another 8,000 people in there. And let's throw in a couple more places that we've got folks coming from. Lakewood, Busti, you can see we're adding another uh, 10 or 11,000 there. So you add up all these townships, Panama, Clymer, Asheville, Sherman, Cory, Lakewood, Busti, you're coming up with a total of 23,353 according to these statistics. So when we read this story in John chapter 6, how many people were actually there? Uh, here's the answer. Pretty much everybody that lives around here. Just picture that in your mind. We had a big region-wide picnic from everybody from those townships that I just mentioned. That's the, about the number of people that we are talking about here. That's a lot of people. <laughs> that's, that's a lot of people. So here's the next question that comes into my mind. Like, how crazy was it to try to feed that many people with five loaves and two fishes? Uh, well, did you know that something similar has happened before in Scripture? Uh, let me go back to the Old Testament for a minute. Let me read a story for you from 2 Kings chapter 4. Have you heard this story? 
2 Kings chapter 4, verse 42 through 44. A man from Baal Shalashah came to the man of God with his sack full of 20 loaves of barley bread. Not five, 20. 20 loaves of barley bread from the first bread of the harvest. Elisha said, give it to the people to eat. But Elisha's attendant asked, what? Am I to set this before a hundred men? Give it to the people to eat, Elisha said, for this is what the Lord says. They will eat, and they will have some left over. So he set it before them, and as the Lord had promised, they ate, and they had some left over. Now, you can maybe see the parallel in this story. It's not exactly the same. I mean, for example, these guys had 20 loaves, not five. 20 loaves, and they didn't have 20,000 people. They had 100, 100 men. And I want to make sure we're clear on this, and not that it matters a great deal to the story, but these stories keep referring to these as loaves of bread. But they're not a loaf of bread like you and I would think of a loaf of bread, right? You go to Walmart or Aldi or Wegmans or wherever and you buy a big loaf of bread. That's not what these would have been like back in this time. It would have been the equivalent to a dinner roll size, right? Something like this. This would have been what they would have called a loaf of bread, just a small little little dinner roll. So in this story that we just read, they had 20 of these for 100 men. And what another, excuse me, another interesting thing that you see there is that they were barley loaves, barley rolls. What's interesting about barley? Barley would have been a, a rough grain used by the poor, right? It was a poor man's grain, barley was. The preferred grain would have been wheat, uh, the wheat roll, the wheat loaf would have been top shelf. Uh, the barley was, that was what you had when you had nothing else to eat. And you can hear the, uh, the doubt in Elisha's servant's mind. Was like, I'm supposed to give 20 of these to 100 guys, and that's supposed to feed us all? So how crazy was it to try to feed that many people with five loaves and two fishes? Well, the answer is pretty crazy. Well, what's the next question then? Maybe they were really big fish, right? How much food really was five loaves and two fish? Maybe these were giant fish. Well, not quite. Scripture says these were small fish. And the emphasis on being small. I, as I was shopping for this and I found some dinner rolls uh, to show you, I tried to think of what would be a small fish. How could we do that? Well, I didn't want to actually buy an actual fish because, uh, you know, just for the smell and all that kind of thing. So I got two cans of tuna, right? That, that's probably close to equivalent. This would have just been like a small fish. And so we've got five loaves, five small loaves and two fish. This, this was a kid's meal. That's what's going on here. Like the Lunchables, this, this was for kids. That's the size that we've got going on here. I remember growing up, I took the Amtrak train. You ever ridden Amtrak? It's a lot of fun. I have great memories of that. We would ride it across the country. At the time, my dad's parents and some relatives lived out on the West Coast up in the Seattle, Washington area. We would get on the train in Indianapolis and ride it out there. And one time my dad and my brother and I were taking a trip across the country. We we're going to go work on some projects for my grandparents. We were pretty young. I mean, junior high, late elementary age, maybe. Uh, and, you know, I can appreciate this now as a, as a parent, but as a child, I didn't really get it. There was one time we were going to order a meal. And so we went into the dining car and they didn't have a lot of options in the dining car. And of course, in a situation like this, everything was really expensive. Uh, and so my dad ordered a meal for himself. Uh, and for my brother and I, we had to uh, order the kid's meal. And not only order the kid's meal, we had to split a kid's meal. And the kid's meal title, you can go back and look this up. They don't do it anymore. I checked. But back in the mid-90s, they had something called the Chew Chew Chewies. That, that was the name of their kid's meal. And it was just a small little thing. And my brother and I had to get that and split that, and that was going to be enough nourishment for that particular meal. That leads me to the answer then to this question. Were they really big fish? No. 
these five loaves and two fishes, that was like ordering a choo-choo chewies. The next question then, is there a goosebump sentence in this story? Man, I am so glad you asked that question. How, how did you know that I wanted to talk about this? Uh, here's the answer. Let me give it to you right up front. It was in verse 10, I think. Did you catch it when we read it? Jesus said, have the people sit down. Man, I got goosebumps when I read that and just meditated on that. And look at what Jesus has done up to this point in the story, right? Jesus has put these disciples and everybody in an impossible situation. Uh, I mean, it's, it's impossible, isn't it? Uh, the disciples had no options, right? The best they can do, the best they can come up with are these five small dinner rolls and two little fish, two cans of tuna, so to speak. Just that, literally this amount of food for everybody that lives in this region. And they say, Jesus, what are we going to do with this? this? This isn't even worth mentioning. And Jesus said, have the people sit down. Man, what that would have been like to have witnessed. And like you're sitting there. Maybe you've seen Jesus do miracles before. You've seen him do the impossible. And you hear him say that. And you like elbow your neighbor, your neighbor. And you're like, did you hear what he just said? Like, did you catch us? Here comes the good part. Watch what Jesus is about to do. And everyone ate until they were full, and they had 12 baskets left over. As I was thinking through this story and trying to think through some of these logistical things, and uh, it led to a couple more questions. Like, why was this the disciples' problem? They're trying to feed everybody. Why was this their problem they were trying to solve? Well, the answer is, Jesus made it their problem. What do I mean by that? Well, we read in another account, in fact, let's read it here, that the disciples tried to pass this on, right? They tried to kind of pass the buck, so to speak. Uh, but Jesus said, no, 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 we're, we're going to solve this. Uh, let me read for you Mark's account of this same story, just a couple of verses in chapter 6, verse 35. When it grew late, his disciples approached him and said, this place is deserted and it is already late. Send them away so that they can go into the surrounding countryside and villages to buy themselves something to eat. You give them something to eat, he responded. Well, they said to him, should we go and buy 200 denarii worth of bread and give them something to eat? And he asked them, well, how many loaves do you have? Go and see. When they found out, they said five and two fish. You know, the disciples, right from the get-go, recognized how insurmountable this problem was. They said, we, it would take 200 denarii. A denarii was one day's wage. So it would have taken approximately, uh, figuring some days off in there, eight months of wages. Eight months of working just to begin to even scratch the surface. And frankly, we read there in John chapter 6, even this amount of money wouldn't have even begun to touch the need that, that they had. So what, what are we going to do, Jesus? Like, let's, just, let's just let them worry about it. Send them home. They can find dinner on their way out. But Jesus knew that the problem was insurmountable. He knew that the Disciples weren't going to be able to come up with any sort of solution. And so why would Jesus make this their problem? If I'm reading through this text, I say, okay, Jesus made this their problem. Why would he do that? Why would he make this their problem? And I think maybe it's because there were some things he wanted them to know. Right? There are some things that he wants you to know as you're reading the story that he wants he wants me to know. In fact, that's the final question that I want to talk about in our time together. What, what does Jesus want me to know as I'm working through this story? I think there's three things. The first is that this was an impossible situation. Right? Just think about some of this. Nobody could have claimed that they, they had close to the right amount of food. Right? It, that meal, the five loaves, two fishes, wasn't even worth mentioning, right? Somebody couldn't look at this and say, well, maybe they had more food than they thought, and they, and they got it to stretch just a little bit more. No, I mean, they, they weren't even close. 
think about that story we read from the Old Testament. There they had 20 loaves and 100 men, right? A multiple of four of the amount of loaves and, and a decimal, decimal fraction of the amount of people. And even then, the people were incredulous. What do you mean? 20 loaves are supposed to feed 100 people? That's, that's crazy. They were in an impossible situation. Jesus wants them to know that. Jesus wants us to know that, right? Because what about things in your life? It, have you ever found yourself in an impossible situation? There's, there's no way out. There's no escape. And God, God could remove us from this impossible situation if He wanted to, but He's put us there. Why? Well, often I think He does it for the same reason that He didn't take the disciples out of the situation. He didn't give the disciples the easy way out of just saying, you're right, send them home, let them figure it out on their own. He did it, Scripture says, as a sign and to test their faith. He does it in our lives to test our faith, to, to stretch us. To say to us, where are you going to turn when you need help? Are you going to try to take the easy way out? Are you going to try to buy your way out of it? Are you going to try to scrounge up some money to see if you can figure out a solution? Are you going to, going to go out there and search among the people, try to find some solutions on your own? Like Maybe if I just go out there and, and search, I can find enough loaves. I can find enough food to do this on my own. No, Jesus wanted the disciples to know, and He wanted us to know that we had no other options. The second thing I think Jesus wanted us to know here is that while this was an impossible situation for every person on earth, it was nothing for Him. Don't miss this. Don't, don't gloss over this. Let's just stay on this idea for just a minute. Right? Because like we, we look at this story and we think, like, wow, this, this was an impossible situation. This was a miracle that Jesus did. And, and try to think logistically, like, how did he make this work? How did, he, how did he do it? I mean, this must have taken everything that Jesus had. He must have really had to have dug down deep in order to get this done. Do we make the mistake of thinking this was really difficult for him to do? He's the maker of the heavens and earth. The almighty creator of the universe, the one that created the stars and the galaxies and put them into their place, and the one that created the world, and the one that created you. This wasn't difficult for him. This was nothing for him. It's impossible for me. Impossible for you. We can't even fathom how this worked. But it was nothing for him. Exhibit A, just in this story, was that the 12 baskets that he had left over. I mean, he started with an amount of food that would have just been a mere fraction of one basket. Maybe it covered the bottom of the basket. Maybe. And he had 12 baskets left over. That's incredible. And the thing is, he could have had 10,000 baskets left over if he wanted to. This was nothing for him. Here's the thing about Jesus. When Jesus applies, it is never too little. Jesus never runs out. He loves to go above and beyond what we can ask or even think of. Paul tells us in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 20, Now to him who is able to do above and beyond all that we ask or think according to the power that works in us. Here's the thing. Jesus has never run into a problem that he can't solve. Right, his first miracle, no wine at the wedding. No problem. The ones we looked at last week, a woman with a 12-year medical condition that was only getting worse, that no one could figure out, no doctor had a clue how to fix it. Jesus solved it. A 12-year-old girl that was dead, that Jesus went and took by the hand and said, little girl, get up. It wasn't an issue for him. Sin and death needing to be defeated at the cross, once and for all, Jesus did it. The disciples coming and saying, Jesus, we need food for 20,000 people, and all we have are five small loaves, five rolls, and two fish. Jesus said, have the people sit down. I think about that, them, them offering those those rolls and those two fish. That leads me to the third thing 
that I think we need to know from this story, and that's this. God can do amazingly great things with the little things that we can offer. This series is called Jesus, Kids, and You. So you might have been asking, where's the kid in the story? Why aren't we talking about kids here? And if you missed him, he was easy to miss. That would be understandable. But he was there in the story. Did you see it? Let me read the verse again. John chapter 6, verse 9. There is a boy here who has five barley loaves and two fish. But what are they for so many? We don't know much of what transpired here. Right? Like, how, how did they find the boy in a crowd that size? How did they come across him? What did they say to him? What, what did he say to them? Oh, we, just, we just don't know. But we can conclude, it seems like, that somehow, some way, the boy's lunch got to Jesus. We know that much. So I think about that. I think about this boy who had his meager lunch. Game comes prepared with this small meal. Word begins to spread that Jesus is looking for food. The disciples are working their way through the crowd asking, did anybody bring anything to eat? And you're sitting there listening to this and you're looking around and you're saying, how, how are you going to get enough food to feed all these people? The boy begins to feel this tug. Well, maybe I've got a little bit of a lunch. I, I can offer that. And it, we don't know if his parents were there with him. We don't know what those around him thought. You know, I know if I was a parent in that situation and I'm looking at this crowd and I hear that they're looking for food and I know what it would take to feed those people. Uh, in, in my one of my kids, you know, little Johnny was like, hey, hey, uh, uh, I, I've got this food I can offer. But like, shh, shh, like, that doesn't solve anything, right? Like, that, that doesn't help. I mean, that's such, such an embarrassing small amount. It'd be better just not to say anything about it than act as if that would help. You know, I'm going to roll my eyes. Put that away. Right? Why would you even suggest that? Surely someone here can provide more or better. But maybe this boy thought, you know, maybe someone can bring more than I can bring. But this is what I can do. This is what I can offer. I don't know what this will do. I'm going to offer it anyway. And we would look at that, or maybe the disciples got it, or whoever was gathering the food. They, they begin to look at it and say, this, this doesn't begin to solve the problem. There's nothing that can be done with this. I, I can't do anything with this. Why would you give this to me? And Jesus says, that's exactly right. You can't do anything with that. But I can. Now, just sit down and watch. Man. I wonder sometimes, how often do we miss a chance to, to get a front row seat to what God can do because we, we think that what we can offer doesn't matter? Or because we think what we can offer is, is too insignificant? I would challenge you to think about this this week. What, what do you have? What has God entrusted to you that you could offer to Him and say, God, I don't know how this solves the problem. God, this doesn't seem to make a dent in anything. I don't know what you can do with this, but I'm ready to offer it. I'm ready to watch what you can do. You know, God puts us in these impossible situations. He put the disciples in an impossible situation because He operates in such a way that all of the praise and all of the glory is His. Right? We don't read this story and say, wow, that little boy is amazing. I mean, look at what that little boy did. Right? We don't do that. We, say, we read the story and we say, no, it's... It's my God that's amazing. Man, look at what God did. Look at this miracle that Jesus did for all of these people. We want things to happen. We want to be a part of things where we could only say, praise be to God. I think about that as it relates to this church, to PBC. Hey, we, we want to reach the region around us. We want to build into the community. We want to reach the 20,000 people that live around here. Those communities, those townships that I mentioned at the beginning of this. Yeah, but we're a, we're a church of about 150 or 200. That doesn't make a dent. How, how is it, this small church going to reach 20,000 people? So, God, I can't do it. But I know you can. Here's my small, meager offering. I want to sit down and watch what you can do. We, our church, we want to help people grow. We want people to take that next step of faith, that next step of obedience to be discipled. But we ourselves are a faulty 
people, we ourselves, sometimes we're just trying to make it through the day. God, how are we going to do this? God says, you can't, but I can. Sit down and watch what I'm about to do. Ask yourself this week, God, what have you given to me that seems small, seems insignificant, doesn't hardly seem worth mentioning, that I can offer back to you, that you can then turn and do amazing things with? God doesn't need us, but he wants to use us to do more than we could ever ask or even think of, demonstrating his unmatched, unparalleled, amazing power in impossible ways. God bless you. I'm praying for you this week as you evaluate in your life, what can you, what can I offer to God? Thank you, Pastor Joel, for sharing with us today. Friends, I want to leave you with these words from Isaiah 55. Let me read it to you. Come, all you who are thirsty, come to the waters. And you who have no money, come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. Why spend money on what is not bread and your labor on what does not satisfy? Listen, listen to me and eat what is good and you will delight in the richest affair. Give ear and come to me. Listen that you may live. Seek the Lord while he may be found. Call on him while he is near. Let the wicked forsake their ways and the unrighteous their thoughts. Let them turn to the Lord and he will have mercy on them. And to our God, for he will freely pardon. For my thoughts are not your thoughts, neither are your ways my ways, declares the Lord. As the heavens are higher than the earth, so are my ways higher than your ways, and my thoughts than your thoughts. Friends, we'll see you next time. In the meantime, you're deployed.